Hey gang, it's Phil here, and we are on Q&A number four. Uh, and I got a really interesting question, a really, I think, important question uh, from Pete Maldonado. And Pete asks, I'm reading it off my notes here. He said, what's the scariest thing about comedians and where it's going with sensitive topics and people's negative responses to certain content and having people attack comedians and destroy their careers? Uh, and I think the phrasing of that question is interesting. And the first thing I think I want to talk about there is that nobody's careers are being destroyed because of what they're saying on stage. It may seem like that in popular culture, but it's just not happening. Uh, to the point where it maybe should be happening <laughs> with with a few people. Um, and 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 I know, and not because of what they're saying on stage. Honestly, the the there's nobody who has said something on stage that's had their career destroyed due to public opinion. Um, even people who have done things. Uh, not on stage, but have done things, uh, are still working uh, off stage. I mean, Cosby is an obvious one to talk about. Uh, he's a horrible person, and he should still be in jail, and unfortunately he's not. He did horrible things in, in sexually abusing women. That's not something he said on stage. He was one of the crispiest, cleanest comedians ever on stage. Uh, Louis C.K., you know, there's that whole thing. Louis was sort of abusing his uh, place in the food chain of comedy uh, to do creepy things to women. But he's out selling out theaters again. So uh, his career certainly hasn't been destroyed. I mean, he doesn't have a TV show. That may not happen again. Um, but he still has a career. It's not been destroyed. But, and that's not even due to what he said on stage. That is because of things that he did as a human being that he should not have done. Um, in other cases like Chris D'Elia, Brian Callen, I think, uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, Tony is a little bit different. Tony, you know, has been lambasted for things he has said on stage, but still his career is on fire. He's doing just fine, uh, with Kill Tony and all that kind of stuff. Chris D'Elia and Brian Callen are still getting booked everywhere, uh, despite all the allegations against those guys. So the, the whole destroying of careers thing really isn't happening. The thing about content and sensitive topics and things like that. And I've had to do a lot of clean shows lately, which um, irritates me. I don't necessarily like to have to do a clean show, especially when I can tell the audience wants something else besides that. Um, I have the material for it. I've got plenty of clean material and I can do the show, but I don't, being li I don't like being restrained in what I can say. And that doesn't mean dick jokes, because honestly, I'm tired of them. That doesn't mean sex jokes, dirty jokes, foul language, anything like that. Oftentimes, a clean show means don't offend the people in the audience. And a lot of times, it means don't offend the white people in the audience, honestly. Um, in my last uh, comedy special, Burning Sensation, which I hope you've seen it or heard it or something. If you haven't, I hope you'll check it out. Uh, that one took five years to write, that whole show, because I was doing material in it that was making people mad. Um, and it wasn't making them mad because of my point of view on it, although I had to change that a couple of times or at least rephrase it. But it was making them mad because they weren't letting me get to the end of the joke to find out what it was. And so I have found that people will sometimes get uncomfortable with a guy with my complexion talking about race issues. Um, I find that religious people get uncomfortable when I talk about religious issues. Um, there's some stuff I'm writing now that I know is going to make people, uh, angry in some places I play. And by the way, it's not a, um, it is a political spectrum thing, but it's not one side or the other, both sides. <laughs> I mean, I've had, I've had bad sets in front of very liberal audiences who didn't let me get to the end of the joke because they heard me say something about black people, um, and it turns out the joke wasn't about black people, it was about me, uh, or something like that. Um, I, I can easily offend uh, conservative audiences. Um, in fact, much easier. I can offend conservative audiences in a lot of cases. Working on a bit right now about how Americans fetishize the flag. I know that's going to get me into some trouble in a few places. And I, as, an, as a performer and a writer and an artist have to not really be concerned about that. Part of the reason that I spend so much time with you is because you are the ones that get it uh, and understand what I do and like what I do. And I don't really care about the other people. If they don't like it, that's fine. It's not for them. Uh, I don't, 
Uh, you know, when you take somebody who's like super mainstreamy, somebody who's selling out arenas, a Gabriel Iglesias or somebody like that, a Jerry Seinfeld, they're great comics, but it's very mainstream, safe, general public kind of comedy. And as an artist, as a writer, that doesn't always float my boat. And so I, I, t I talk about what I'm going to talk about and what I want to talk about. And the trick is with some of the material and what took five years to write Burning Sensation was that I had to phrase my jokes in a way that would allow them to come on the journey with me to get all the way to the punchline. And that was dicey in a few nights. Um, never was anybody offended that was the subject of a joke. So if I did a joke about African-Americans, it was never the African-Americans that got offended. Um, remember an Asian guy got offended at the African-American joke one night. When I do Asian jokes, it's never the Asian people that get offended. It's the white people that get offended for them. It's, it's always somebody else watching out for somebody else, which I think is fantastic, by the way. We all need to be watching out for each other. Uh, and so I understand the the empathy behind that kind of thing. And I don't have a problem with it. It was my job then as a comedian to phrase the jokes in a way, to use the words in a way that would allow those people to come on the journey with me and get all the way to the punchline so that they understood my actual point of view. Because, you know, the comedy is about left turns, hard left turns and surprises and things like that. So the initial part of a joke may make people go, ooh, where's it going with this? And then we bring it back around and they see that, you know, I'm on the right side of things. So it is difficult because, well, here's an interesting thought. You are never seeing a finished comedy show unless you're watching that comedian take their special. That is the only time you're seeing an actual finished comedy show. Before that, everything is a development process because we can't develop it sitting here in a studio like this. Uh, we have to develop it in front of audiences to see what works. And so you're going to you're going to get stuff that's not done yet at every show you see unless you're watching that comedian's finished special. And uh, and there's going to be things that go wrong. There's going to be things that we haven't written correctly to click with that audience. Uh, and there's going to be sometimes where that audience just doesn't click with it at all. And, you know, that's fine, whatever it is. Um, I know if I do a whole bunch of religion material with religious people in the audience, some of them will come up to me and go, ah, okay, all right, all right, all right. And some people will walk out and not look at me. Um, the same thing with any political material, social issue material, that kind of stuff. And uh, the way to avoid that is to do super safe you know, my wife and kids, my job, what do you do for a living kind of material. And that just doesn't uh, artistically float my boat at all. Um, I'll do some of that, of course. Uh, you know, even even George Carlin did goofy little wordplay jokes and things like that. So I think I think there's two, two real answers here. One, nobody's career is being destroyed by public opinion on Twitter or the, you know, any other social channels or, or anything like that. Everybody's still getting booked. In fact, there is a whole... Um, sort of subgenre of stand-ups right now that are leaning into hard right material and um, which if anything was going to get lambasted uh, would be that uh, when it does filter into and we're all in our own bubbles and things but when that does filter into my bubble it does get lambasted and honestly I think a lot of that material is really not well written and strictly not from a ideological point of view or I can disagree with the joke and still appreciate the writing of it and the creation of it. A lot of that stuff is just not well created. Um, but of course there's a lot of liberal comedy that's not well created either. There's a lot of comedy in general that's not well created. So nobody's being, nobody's career is being destroyed uh, because of something they said on stage. Uh, even if it gets passed all around the internet, whatever, there's always going to be somebody that agrees with them on that joke, regardless of how sound the thinking of the joke behind it might be. Uh, and so there's always going to be somebody that agrees with them and will be a fan of whatever that is. Um, you know, I always say uh, every band is somebody's favorite and every comedian is somebody's favorite. Um, so I think I think that's my answer. Nobody's being... Nobody's careers are being destroyed unless they're doing things off stage that makes them a horrible human being. 
Uh, I think we we are pretty still, you know, fairly on board with what they do on stage. We may not always like it, but somebody's going to like it. There are a lot of people that don't like what I do, and I hear about it every day. Uh, and those people just are not are not you. <laughs> and you are the ones that I appreciate who do understand and enjoy my work. So uh, I hope I answered that. Um, you know, there's always going to be negative responses to comedy. Oh, you know what? Let me. I want to tell you about this. I was listening to an old interview with George Carlin from, I think it was from the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And he was talking about this. Uh, he was talking about working the college circuit because the interviewer had asked him, hey, you know, the college circuit we hear a lot about now is, you know, notoriously PC or woke or whatever you want to call it. Um, all those words are dumb. And it, this was, you know, George Carlin came up in the college circuit. And at the time, it was, you know, thought of, or at least the interviewer thought of it at that time, as sort of this bastion of anything goes, you can say anything. That was the place where you could go to really be subversive as a comedian. And it did that well for George Carlin. But even he said in this interview, there were a lot of things I couldn't say to a college audience because it would offend them. This is 30 years ago. None of this is new. None of this is new. It's just that we see it every day in social media now where we didn't back then. Nobody knew what was going on at college shows unless you were at the college show, you know, and people got just as offended at jokes back then. I don't think any of that has changed. I think people have always been offended. If, you, if people uh, uh, who like clean comedy only like clean comedy, bugs me to no end, <laughs> only like clean comedy, that, that means they don't like anything that makes them uncomfortable. And so anything that does make them uncomfortable, they're not going to like. And I've had people tell me, I don't like uh, comedians that talk about religion. I don't like comedians that talk about politics. I don't like comedians that talk about social issues. I don't like comedians that play guitar. I don't like, what, there's, everybody's got something they don't like. And so there's something for everybody out there. Uh, and we don't always have to agree with it. And um, I hope that people will. I, what I would like to see is just, I would like to see people stay on board with the joke until the end and have some patience with it uh, to see where it goes. And that's not always the case. People do jump the gun a little bit now, but you know, it's natural. I, when I hear a joke that um, I don't agree with, or at least I hear a setup to a joke that I don't agree with, I'll kind of tighten up and go, okay, where's this going? But I do wait to find out where it goes at the end. Um, so I think that's my thoughts on it. I think it's our job as comedians to express ourselves in the most concise way not in a 12 minute, almost 13 minute video <laughs> to express ourselves in the most concise way that puts our point of view across. People are paying to hear our point of view. If we don't have a strong point of view, then we're not really fulfilling the duties of our, of our position. Um, and so I don't want to be, you know, mainstreamy, you know, I have no problem with mainstream, but I have no, I don't really want it to be as safe. I don't want to not make people uncomfortable because I think that's part of the job of comedy is to make people think a little bit differently about something in a way that they hadn't thought to think about it before. And that may be something stupid and a dick joke, and it may be something, you know, deeper and more philosophical about the world. It can go either way. And I think there's room for both out there. Um, so anyway, I think that's my answer. Nobody's, nobody's career has been destroyed because they pick up a fan base somewhere else. And it's our job as comedians to make our point of view heard in the most concise way. And the people that like it, like it. And the people that don't, don't. All right. And thank you for liking what I do. And, uh, we'll have more soon. All right. Bye.